University, if you're from outside of Fordham University. And if you're not from outside of Fordham University, then welcome to this um, wonderful occasion um, of the Anastasi Lecture, which commemorates the legacy of Anna Anastasi and her work in psychology. Uh, my name is um, Eva Badowska, and I'm Dean of the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences, and it is my great pleasure to be able to introduce you to this occasion. You will know right away that I'm not a psychologist, because I feel myself compelled to begin with a short narrative, um, an anecdote that your colleague, Mary Procedano, told the New York Times for an article published in May 2001, when Anne Anastasi passed away at the age of 92. I quote it in full. Once, Dr. Procedano heard a shriek coming from Dr. Anastasi's office. Running to see what was wrong, she found Dr. Anastasi trying to pry a plug out of an electrical outlet by using a metal lever opener. <laughs> Did you get a shock? Dr. Procedano asked. Fascinating, Dr. Anastasi replied, letter opener in hand. How did you know it was a shock? It is all about context, isn't it? In the context of an obituary article on Anne Anastasi, where both speakers' names carry the doctor in front of them, this little vignette speaks of a charming indifference to the more practical aspects of daily life. It is charming because of everything else we know about Anne Anastasi's scientific achievements, including the 1984 gold medal for lifetime achievement from the American Psychological Foundation, and the National Medal of Science, the nation's highest award for scientific achievement, which she received in 1987. She was only the third woman to have the American Psychological Association as president as well. In a different context, however, and without these academic titles to cue us into the true meaning of the story, the little vignette could have had drastically different meanings. For example, it could have been a story about lacuna in a person's basic scientific literacy. <coughs> in a manner of speaking, the role of context in our interpretation of this anecdote illustrates a topic dear to an Anas Anna Anastasi's heart, known as the test scorer and recognized as a pioneer in the field of psychometrics. Anna Anastasi made major conceptual contributions to the understanding of the manner in which psychological development is influenced by environmental and experiential factors. In essence, and from a literary critic's point of view, that's me, um, Anna Anastasi studied and emphasized the importance of context and frames of reference in the understanding of tests, test scores, test takers, and test givers. She wrote, for example, that no intelligence now, a test can be culture-free because human intelligence is not culture-free. Anastasi's academic biography is, from this point of view, astounding, as it defies the standards of her and our own times. Anastasi was homeschooled until the age of nine. She dropped out of high school after two years and skipped high school altogether. She enrolled at Barnard at the age of 15 and graduated at 19 with a BA in psychology. She entered Columbia and received her doctorate in two years at the ripe old age of 21. She never had time for electricity. <laughs> Anastasi's book, Psychological Testing, is hailed as one of the most important psychology texts of the 20th century. She had an extensive career in higher education, teaching at Barnard, Queens College, Columbia University, and finally here at Fordham, where she made her home from 1947 until her retirement in 1979. As longtime faculty member and department chair, Anastasi exerted a lasting and formative influence on our psychology department, and the continued significance of psychometrics among the fields represented here at the doctoral level. Anastasi's legacy lives on in the broader scientific community, of course, but it does so in a very concrete form here at Fordham as well. In 2007, Fordham University established the Anne Anastasi Chair in Quantitative Psychology and Psychometrics and has further endowed the Anne Anastasi Memorial Scholarships with a multi-million dollar gift from the estate of Anne Anastasi. The gift left, in our provost's words, a profound legacy in the study of psychology at Fordham. <coughs> Dr. David Budesco, uh, your Master of Ceremonies today, 
um, is the current distinguished occupant of the Anna Anastasi chair. He will introduce to you today's speaker in a moment. But let me say a couple of words about David first. David Budescu, the Anna Anastasi Professor of Psychometrics and Quantitative Psychology, received his PhD from the UNC Chapel Hill in 1980. He held tenured positions at the University of Illinois and the University of Haifa, and visiting positions at Carnegie Mellon, University of Gothenburg, the Kellogg School of Northwestern University, and the Israel Institute of Technology. His research is in the areas of human judgment, individual and group decision making under uncertainty and with incomplete and vague information, and statistics for the behavioral and social sciences. He is associate editor of Decision Analysis and Psychological Methods, and on the editorial boards of Applied Psychological Measurement, Journal of Behavioral Decision Making, Journal of Mathematical Psychology, and Multivariate Behavioral Research. He's past president of the Society for Judgment and Decision Making and fellow of the Association for Psychological Science. David? It's a pleasure to welcome all of you to this annual lecture. I'm very happy to see many familiar faces and even happier to see many first comers, and I hope you'll become regular as well. Uh, I want to start by thanking very much uh, the Graduate School of Art and Science and the Department of Psychology for their continuous and enthusiastic support for this uh, series of lecture, and their support makes my job very, very easy and very pleasant, and all I have to do is to spend a few minutes here introducing our distinguished speaker. So our guest today is Professor Bob Sternberg, who is a professor of human development at Cornell University, as well as uh, honorary professor of psychology at Heidelberg University in Germany. Uh, Bob has a long list of accomplishments. He lists as his research interest, intelligence, creativity, wisdom, reasoning, intellectual development, love and close relationship, and many others. Now, you may think that this is a list of things that he's interested in a passive and intellectual way, but in fact, he has made contributions to each one of these areas. And in fact, he has published over 1,500 chapters, books, and uh, papers, and he has contributed to all of these areas. He is considered to be one of the top in the top, the top 100 most influential and important psychologists in the 20th century. This is not my observation. This is an empirical fact that was established and validated through a couple of surveys. And his uh, work has been uh, recognized uh, in a variety of ways. Uh, he was past president, his past president of APA, uh, and he's also, as well as four divisions of APA, he is member of the um, Academy of Education and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He has uh, honorary doc uh, doctorate degrees from 13 universities on three continents. And I could go on forever, but I don't think that, uh, I think you get the picture. So uh, not only is he influential and he's made this contribution in all these fields, he has made these contributions very, very early. In uh, the fall of 1977, I was the first year graduate student taking a seminar on individual differences in cognitive abilities that was taught by a distinguished psychometrician, J.B. John B. Carroll. And the list of reading for that class consisted of all the who's who in the history of intelligence. Spearman, Serstone, Anastasi, Gutman, Guilford, and Bob Sternberg. And that was the only name none of us recognized on, on the syllabus, of course. And it turns out we were reading uh, Bob's dissertation that he completed a year or two earlier at Stanford under Gordon Bauer, uh, which would then become, a couple of years later, became uh, you know, a very uh, a widely cited paper in, in psychological review. And it's quite clear that Jack Carroll had uh, an eye for talent, and he recognized his contribution and his potential at the very early age. And so without uh, further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce Bob, and we look forward to your talk. Thank you. Uh, 
Well, why don't I just get started while you're uh, fiddling with that. Uh, I guess I'm supposed to start with a story about how well I know Miwan and Anastasi, uh, and I actually only met her once, uh, which was a very pleasant meeting, but I thought instead I would tell you a guilty secret that I've never told anyone else, uh, and that is that my, on my dissertation committee was Lee Cronenbach, her arch rival. So for those of you who are old enough, Lee and Anne had the, really the only two books in psychological testing that mattered. Uh, and I only mention this because I taught psychological testing only once as a seminar. And the guilty secret is that even though Lee was on my committee, I used Anne's book. So <laughs> some of those millions came from my students. Uh, and I just wanted to know that. Uh, the, uh, the, well, it doesn't get any better. Uh, the other thing I thought I should do is since I'm going to be talking about culture, uh, it occurred to me I should say something that, about New York culture. And I don't know anything about New York culture. I grew up in New Jersey. Um, <laughs> but I do live in Ithaca, New York. And as you know, it's sort of a hick town in the middle of the state. Uh, and the stereotype about people. The stereotype about people from New York City is like you're kind of narcissistic and into yourselves and you know it's all about me, me, me uh, in New York City. Unlike the generous, uh, you know, giving people in the middle of this New York State. Uh, so I, I found though that I just discovered a few minutes ago something about myself that I never knew. I had to I had to go to the men's room before, I mean, this is a little personal, but before I gave the talk, uh, and when I went, there were two doors. One said women, and the other said me. Uh, and I went right into the me one, and I felt very good about it. I don't know why it says me, but I feel the two belong in the market after all. Uh, it, it is it actually says men. It's different. It's so we're culturally different. So that's, that's pretty much the talk, and then I would slides. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about culture, intelligence, and society. Uh, and part of what motivated my work in this area was in 1931, uh, when I was uh, 26, uh, and I was in London, uh, and I was in the two, I think they call it the two, you know, the metro. And uh, I went in the metro and there was a sign and it said, no busking. Uh, and I didn't know what busking was. And the longer I was in the two, the more I began to worry that I was busking. <laughs> I, I asked myself, how do you know you're not busking if you don't know what busking is? I really got uncomfortable. And I sort of got afraid I'd be arrested for doing something I didn't know what it was. So I left the tube uh, and later discovered it was like singing uh, in the uh, tube, which uh, you don't want to hear. Uh, but I realized <coughs> that even though England is very similar to us culturally, you know, I could have been arrested there uh, I was doing something I didn't know was illegal. Then I was in Manchester, and I was starting to cross the street, and I did my usual thing of looking right before I crossed. And of course, I almost got run over by a bus because they drive on the wrong side of the street. <laughs> um, and what I realized is that if you define intelligence as adaptive behavior, even in a culture that's very similar to ours, right? The UK is about as similar as you get. Uh, you can be killed by a bus or arrested in the subway. So there, it struck me, well, maybe these cultural differences are really important, uh, and that's what I'll talk about today. So we've had collaborators um, in many, many countries. Uh, I'm only going to be able to talk about a very small portion of our cultural research today. Uh, I've written articles on the rest of it, uh, but I just want to acknowledge all our collaborators and our funders uh, and so on, and especially the Partnership for Child Development. So I'll start with an introduction, which is now over. Uh, so is the talk. Uh, then I'll talk about some cultural studies. Then I'll talk about some applications to the United States, uh, including one that we're doing right now, for which we've had data for about a week, so it's as recent as you get. Uh, and then I'll talk some conclusions. Uh, and then it'll be 8 o'clock and we'll all leave. Uh, don't laugh. I usually have the doors locked from the outside because I hate people to grow So the mission in our work is to understand how to develop and assess abilities, competencies, and expertise. That's kind of what we do. Uh, and to help people transform abilities into competencies and competencies and the expertise. So what we're really interested in is the idea that abilities are modifiable. 
that they vary by place and time, and that these are things that you can develop as you get older. So uh, some of the main messages of the talk are that almost all parents want their kids to be smart, but getting smart means different things in different cultures. So I'll be talking about how it is that there can be a mismatch between what people mean by smart in one culture and in another, or what parents mean by smart and what teachers mean by smart, leading the teachers to think certain kids are smarter simply because their conception of intelligence is closer to that of the parents in one ethnic group than in another. Uh, the second point I'll be making is that intelligence has to be understood, measured, and developed in its cultural context, which means that if you use as many cultural psychologists do, or cross-cultural psychologists, one test, an IQ test, or an SAT, or an ACT, or whatever it is, and you move it into a different culture, it's going to tell you something, but probably not what you think it's telling you. Because it doesn't mean the same thing in another culture, or a subculture, as it could in one. And finally, that education and society need to take into account the cultural and ecological context in which intelligence is embedded. And if you don't do that, you're just, you're just creating a myth. So my view, which is not shared by some of your past speakers, as I was saying, uh, is that this idea that intelligence is just general intelligence or IQ or SAT scores or ACT scores, they all measure the same thing, SAT, ACT, IQ, uh, are all very highly correlated with each other, and they tell you something, but I'll argue not what people think they tell you. So I just want to start by making the point that in the kind of research we've done in other countries, you're dealing with something really different. Like here, you worry about is the lighting good, uh, is the airflow good? Uh, is it quiet? Uh, this is a building we were testing in Tanzania, which collapsed as we were doing the testing. So it's much harder to do the kinds of testing we do in other cultures than it is here, and as a result, sometimes the data are noisy. <laughs> okay, so what motivates uh, our work is what I call the theory of successful intelligence. And basically, a successful intelligence is your ability to succeed in life within your cultural context. So it's not IQ, it's not SAT. It's it, it, the ability to succeed according to your own definition of success within your cultural context. And you do that by capitalizing on strengths, figuring out what you do well, and making the most of that, and compensating for correcting weaknesses. So if you look at great psychologists or great educators, they're not, not all great in the same way. They figure out something they do really well, and they make the most of that. Uh, through adaptation to shaping and selecting of environments, so sometimes you change yourself to fit the environment. Uh, you know, sometimes you change the environment to fit you, you shape, and sometimes you get out. So this can be true in a relationship. You try to adapt to the other person, it doesn't work. You try to shape the other person, it doesn't work, you get out. Or it could be a job, or it could be anything. Uh, by a combination of analytical, creative, and practical, and wisdom-based, and ethical skills and attitudes. And all that means is that, say, when you give a talk, or when you write a paper, or when you do a project, you need creative ideas, you know, you need creativity to come up with ideas, right? So if I came up with some ideas for this talk. The student writes a paper, the student write, comes up with ideas for the paper, you write a grant proposal, you come up with ideas for the grant proposal. Uh, you invent something, you come up with ideas for the invention. Uh, you try to, you, you're on a first date, you try to figure out creatively how to make it work, if you like the person, uh, not to make it work if you don't. Uh, then you use analytical skills to decide if your ideas are really good, because no matter how creative you are, not every idea you're going to have is good. You use, you use practical skills to implement your ideas and try to persuade others of their value. So here I'm trying to persuade you of the value of these ideas. Uh, and then you need wisdom and ethical skills uh, in order to help ensure that your ideas are for some kind of common good and not just for yourself. Okay. I hope that makes sense. So that's different from the IQ view or the SAT view. Because SATs measure analytical skills, that's it. They don't measure creative skills, they don't measure common sense, they don't measure wisdom, they don't measure ethics. So according to this, this is a broader view of intelligence, and as I said, some people like that, some not. So the contrast is that on this view, intelligence is largely valuable. 
any intelligence is broader taking into account than most higher level adaptive tasks have at least a creative, analytical, and practical component, and sometimes they have a wisdom based on content. So the theory, I'm not going to get into that. Let's, let's just move on. Uh, I think I'm going to just go to the study. So uh, we started a little late, and I don't want to go really late, so I may skip a few slides. Uh, so the first point I want to make is that children and adults may be able to do tasks in one cultural and ecological context, but not in another. So traditional cross-cultural psychology would give you a test, and then if you go into another culture, you translate it, and you give those people the test, and then you find out that the people in the other culture aren't as good as the people in your culture. That was the traditional cross-cultural psychology. Uh, Karen Senior Nunez did some studies with street children in Brazil, and basically what she found is that if you gave kids mathematics tests in an academic setting, you know, from a book, the kids did crappy, and the, you know, the kids uh, in, who were, you know, like our kids, uh, who were, we are children, would do much better. Well, that's not so surprising. You know, kids from slum areas don't do very well on standardized tests, whether they're achievement or ability or whatever. Uh, then what she did is she tested the kids' mathematical knowledge in their natural context, which was selling stuff on the street which they have to do to survive because they really don't live in homes, they just sort of live on the street. And what she found is that when she asked them to make change or give discounts or whatever it was, the kids did fine. They did the same mathematical operations on the street that they couldn't do in a classroom with sort of abstract mathematical problems. So you might think, well, that's Brazilian street kids, you know, that's far away, what's that have to do with us? But Gene Lane essentially found the same thing among housewives in Berkeley, California. That if you gave them math problems in a classroom from a book, they didn't do very well. But if you looked at their comparison shopping in the supermarket before they had comparison prices, they were very good. And many people discover that about themselves, that they can do some things in practical settings, but they don't know the theory so well. So, you know, psychologists don't necessarily have, let's say social psychologists don't necessarily have the best interpersonal relationships, even though they might get 100% on a social psychology test. <laughs> or people who study love like me don't necessarily have, you know, a history of perfect love relationships. <laughs> just to have some of the, you know, <laughs> uh, the, the point is that there's a difference between how well you can do on a test of something and how well you actually do it. You know, it's like, you could get 100% on a written driver's test, it doesn't mean you can drive. You know, I mean, like, if you were in a car with someone in New York, and they told you, well, I got 100% on the written driver's test, but I've never driven before, that would get you nervous, okay? So that's the point. All right. Second point is that students may develop contextually important skills at the expense of academic ones. So this was a study we did in Canada. <coughs> Uh, they were Luo, Luo students um, from small villages in Kenya. So these are really kids who are from very, very agricultural kinds of settings. That's a school. Uh, these are the kids. Uh, they speak the Luo as their first language. And the question we ask is whether a relationship uh, of practical intelligence is measured by tacit knowledge, natural medicine, to academic intelligence, to you. Let me explain what happened. So here's the story. Uh, at one point, I was talking to a parasitologist who worked at Oxford University. Uh, and she mentioned that she knew kids in Kenya through her work, through her parasitology work, that uh, would do very poorly in school and on tests, but they would know the names of like 100 natural medicines that could be used to combat parasitic illnesses. And I said, that's really interesting, because from my point of view as a psychologist, those kids have, are really smart. I mean, like, you know, if intelligence is largely your ability to adapt to shape and select environments, those kids have the adaptive skills that matter in their environments. Because fighting, you know, knowing how to combat malaria, or how to combat schistosomiasis, or how to combat hookworm or whitworm, would be really important to them. It wouldn't be important to your kids, but you know, if you ever get cancer or heart disease or whatever, then knowing how to combat those becomes really important to you. And if you think the doctors are going to do it all, you'll find quickly that's wrong. So what I asked uh, Kate Notes is, I wonder what the relationship would be if we were to create a test 
uh, knowledge of how to use these natural herbal medicines with academic intelligence and academic achievement as measured by standard tests. So an example of a problem was a small child in your family has HOMA. She has a sore throat, headache, and fever. She has been sick for three days. Which of the following five, Yad, Nayal, Luo, 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 medicines, can treat HOMA? And then you have a choice uh, of Chamama, Kavadali, Luo, Odaka, Ogaka, and Ahundo. So I'm not going to go into detail about this, but the point is you couldn't get any of them right, and there's no reason you should. You know, you're, you don't need to fight just the Samaiasis, probably, or Whipworth. But then you could ask, why should those kids do well on your test? Because this is, this is knowledge that's relevant to them, but the knowledge that you think is important, it really doesn't matter to them, because most of them are going to go to elementary school for a few years, and they're going to drop out. And that's, you know, all this academic stuff, for most of those kids, is going to have no relevance to their lives. So we asked, what's going to be the correlation with academic intelligence and achievement? And we thought it would be zero, because in my theory, academic and practical intelligence are different, but instead it was inverse. It was negative. So then the question, that we didn't expect. And then the question was, well, why do we get inverse correlations? Why were they negative? And you know, we thought about it, and we were working with some anthropologists on our team. And what they realized is why this is likely to be. And that is, what is a smart kid in rural Kenya? A smart kid is a kid who goes to school for a very small number of years and then gets an apprenticeship and drops out. Okay? They get, the smart ones get the apprenticeship so that they can make a career. And the not so smart ones, no one wants to take on as an apprentice, so they continue in school. Now that may sound funny, you know, like the not so smarts, practically speaking, are in school longer. But it's not so different here. If you look at the people in Silicon Valley, the smart ones are out of school and they make money. Now, I hate the brand, but my son Seth dropped out of business school to make money. Uh, he's doing really well. He's going to take care of me when I'm older. He doesn't know it yet. But <laughs> to support my petition for his money to help me. He just heard that very sickly hard. So, but the point is, even in this country, often the people who go into certain occupations, like entrepreneurs like Seth, drop out of school because they get funding, and the funders literally tell them, you want to stay in a school that's fine, we're not going to fund you. That's what happened to him and a lot of other kids in Silicon Valley. So it's not just in rural Kenya. And so this just shows the correlations that the tacit knowledge test if you look at the correlations with the academic measures in the first column, they're all negative. OK, so the point I'm trying to make is when you talk about G theory or general intelligence theory, the G correlates positively with everything, general intelligence. It depends on the cultural set. If, if you look at correlations with uh, intel <coughs> intelligence tests and achievement tests, in this culture, they'll correlate positively because when Binet created the first intelligence test, he created them. To, based on the skills that are used in school. That's how we created the tests. So it's not surprising they would correlate positively. But if you're looking at the correlations of those tests to tacit knowledge about natural over medicines, different game. OK, so the point is that traditional education is differentially valued in different places around the world. Other forms of education may be valued more highly, like apprenticeships, or in Seth's case, starting a business and getting funded for it. Uh, valuing depends on what is instrumental in the culture. Students may be well educated according to their culture, but not according to Western standards. Uh, and the same principles really apply in Europe and the US. If you look at Silicon Valley, the truth is the BAs are running the PhDs. You know, Seth has a lot of PhDs working for him. But most of the top entrepreneurs do not have PhDs. So it's not so different here. OK, so the third study, the next study I'm going to talk about is one we did in Alaska uh, with Yupik Eskimos. And the point of this study is that students may have substantial practical skills that go unrecognized in academic tests. So we were working in southwest Alaska in very small rural fishing villages. And this is an example of a fishing village. They're really desolate. And you, in the winter, you can only get there by plane, and the planes usually don't come. So you just, if you want to take a plane, you just go every day and hope there'll be a plane. 
and that's because of the weather. And the question was, what is the relationship between intelligence, academic, analytical intelligence, and practical intelligence in the context of the lives of these rural Alaska Yupik Native Americans? Okay, so that's so now we're not in Kenya anymore, we're in the United States. Uh, so we again did a sort of anthropological analysis of what do you need to be smart in these rural communities. Again, these, these kids are going to become fishermen, uh, they're going to become homemakers, they're going to become uh, agricultural people. They're not going to, almost none of them, only none of them are going to get PhDs and almost none of them are so here's a, here's a typical item we use with these kids. When Andy runs to collect the Parmesan he just shot, he notices that his front pouch, the balloon, is full of Parmesan food. This is a sign that there's a storm on the way, winter is almost over, it's hard to find food this season, or it hasn't snowed in a long time. So again, these are important things for hunters and fishermen to know. They're not important for you, but the kinds of stuff that we think is so valuable to put on the SAT, whether it's the old SAT, the older SAT, the new SAT, the newer SAT, or the ACT, it's not so important. So what we found is that urban students outperform rural UBIC students on academic intelligence tests. That's the same thing everyone else finds. But we also found that rural UBIC students outperform urban students on the UBIC practice. So you can see the results here that for the Cattell, which is a test of fluid ability, and the Nil Hill, which is a test of crystallized ability, the urban kids did better. But for our practical intelligence measure of the third column, whether it's for boys or girls, the rural kids did better. So who's smarter? Or if you look at it in terms of adaptivity to their own cultural context, it all depends. The smarting depends on what the context you have to do. Similarly, some of us may be you know, smart as professors, but if we were business executives, we wouldn't look so smart. Or it could be even that someone who is smart in physics wouldn't do so well in English literature and vice versa. So smart really depends an awful lot on the interaction between what you're good at and not good at in the context you're in, just as with these different cultures. And just as feeling comfortable going into the me room as I did. So academic intelligence modestly predicted adaptive skills, but not hunting skills in the urban rural community. So it, you know, academic intelligence didn't predict what they need to do to be able to put food on the table. And I've said to my wife a number of times, I'm really lucky I don't live in a hunting society because we all in my family would be dead. Uh, and practical intelligence modestly predicted adaptive skills and moderately predicted hunting skills in the rural communities, but not in the urban communities. So what predicts? <laughs> it depends on where you are and what's important in that culture. And that's the point of the right So students may have critical knowledge that is important for their adaptation. The teachers do not have it vice versa. Think about it. The teachers of these kids think the Alaskan kids are dumb, but these kids can go like 50 miles or more in the winter on a dog sled uh, in the frozen tundra where there are no sort of landmarks and they can get there. If you if you were talking about kids from here, they couldn't do that, but some of the kids from here would be looked at as very smart by the teachers even though they can't adapt to the culture. So teachers would not adequately be able to adapt in student environments just as the students don't adapt so well to the teachers' environments. Test are predictably bad is an interaction among person test situations. Okay, I'm gonna, again for matters of time, I'm not gonna talk about the Russian study, I'm gonna just say what the result was. And that is that it, when we measured academic and practical intelligence in Russia, we found that if you're talking about health, people's health, tests of practical intelligence and academic intelligence both predicted health but practical intelligence was a better predictor in a population where there's a lot of illness. Same kind of finding, but I'm going to move. So we've done other studies in Tanzania, Zanzibar, Zambia, Gambia, India, and elsewhere. And again, these are published, or you know, you can write them for results. Okay, so the next kind of study is different. And that is, I've been talking about performance-based measures of intelligence. The next kind of study is most of the intelligence testing that's done in a culture, 99.9% .9 of it is not done by IQ and SAT and ACT or any kind of test, school grade. 
It's done simply by implicit theories of intelligence, folk conceptions of intelligence. When you go out and you meet a new possible uh, girlfriend or boyfriend, you don't usually give them an IQ test. Or, you know, the, fir if you, the first question you ask is, what were your SATs? That's probably not a good start. So, you know, but you probably care about their intelligence, so you get a sense of their intelligence by talking to them and looking at what they do. When you go for a job interview, maybe for a low-level job, you know, you can take a, an ability test, but for a high-level job, if you were to take a test, it's not going to be an IQ test, and most of the judgment about how smart the person is is from the job interview. When I'm giving a talk today, some of you may be thinking, boy, I can see this guy is going to be a real bomb in an IQ test, but, and I was as a kid, but, you know, it would be socially awkward for you to say before, you know, before you continue the talk, would you please take the damn IQ test, and if you don't get it, at least 130, I'm not going to listen to the rest of the talk. That's awkward. So you judge how smart a speaker is in the series by their talk. And that's what I mean by implicit theories of folk conceptions. That's the way most judgments of intelligence are done. So in the United States, if you look at implicit theories, the three main factors that come out of practical problem solving, verbal, and social competence. If you look in Taiwan, the factors are somewhat different. We found cognitive ability, interpersonal confidence, your ability to get along with others, interpersonal confidence, your understanding of yourself, knowing when to show your intelligence, like when you give a talk like this, you're trying to look smart, uh, or some people do, obviously, not me. Uh, and then knowing when not to show your intelligence. Like, you don't go out on a first date and try to impress your date with your latest physics experiment, unless maybe the person's also a physicist, right? I mean, you just have to know that, you know, just showing how sheerly intellectual you are doesn't, and we, I know it doesn't work. I mean, like, when I was, when I, listen, when I was in seventh grade, I was really interested in a girl named Sandy, but I'll call her, I'm going to call her Sarah to describe her identity. Because I, <laughs> I, I, I swear to God, I was doing a, this is true, I was doing a project on IQ testing because I did poorly on IQ tests as a kid and I wanted to figure out why. And I, you know, I was sort of shy and I didn't know how to get Sarah, who was very Sandy, to like me, and I gave her an IQ test. I did, because I was doing a project on IQ testing. She totally turned off. I mean, that was the end of the relationship. <laughs> uh, I, I am totally over that. It was years ago. I don't know how you know, So the point I'm trying to make about Sarah is that, you know, if you first meet someone, don't give them an IQ test. You know, that is not the time to show how. It's not the way to show how. Uh, in rural Kenya, uh, we found four terms that characterized intelligence. Rieka, Laura, Paro, and Winjo, and only one of those had anything to do with what would be on an IQ test, Rieka. And most of the knowledge they cared about was not academic knowledge, but practical knowledge. And the other things that matter were respect initiative and comprehension of the complexities of problems in everyday life. So Western tests reflect a relatively small set of even Western notions of what constitutes intelligent behavior. The test may be quite inadequate, in assessing broader notions of intelligence, and indigenous tests can help assess people according to what they mean by intelligence. Okay, so the last study I'm going to talk about in this series is one I mentioned at the beginning, and that is the teachers' evaluations of students are constrained by their conceptions of intelligence. So this is a study we did in San Jose. And what basically we were interested in what do parents mean by intelligence, what do teachers mean by intelligence, and is it the case that if the parent's conception and the teacher's conception are a better match, the teacher will think the kid's smarter? So that's not really about how smart the kid is. It's about the match between what a teacher thinks is smart and a parent thinks is smart. And you know, this really matters. I mean, honestly, when I was in graduate school, I think one of the reasons I didn't become the great psychometrician I hoped to be is that I think Gordon Bauer, my main advisor, thought I was pretty smart. And my psychometrician advisor, Lee Kronbeck, did not think I was very smart, which is probably why he was then as the book to get in. But that's a more Freudian story. That would be more your uh, domain. Um, and so even within a small environment, people look for different things in terms of what they mean by smart. So the question was, do students have a particular ethnic group do better in school if their parents' conception of intelligence matches that of students' teachers? And we found yes. Anglo-American and Asian-American parents emphasize cognitive competence in their 
conceptual intelligence, leave Latino American parents emphasize social competence, teachers emphasize cognitive competence, and so teachers more value the skills of the Anglo American and Asian American students because their conceptions of intelligence, the teacher's conception, match the parents' conception. So it really matters what a teacher means by smart. And if it it's like what I described with the, the Eskimo kids, right? What the teachers meant by smart did not correspond to what the kids did well, so the kids look stupid. So teachers sometimes have limited views of what it means for a child to be intelligent. Parents have their own views and socialize their students to be intelligent according to their own views. Students thus may be smart in the home or community, but not in the school, and teachers need to broaden their conception of intelligence, which is the same set of themes that have been running through all of these studies. That what we mean by intelligent, we may think it's right, and we and you know there, there are some people in the psychometric who are very dogmatic. They know what it is. They don't just think they know. They know uh, because you know they're on the mountaintop and so on. But the problem is that that only works narrowly for certain reasons. Uh, and so we did another study, and that is suppose that you teach kids according to sort of materials that are based on what they do in their lives rather than the kinds of artificial stuff we find in textbooks. Uh, so suppose you teach you the Eskimo kids mathematics in a, term, in a way that capitalizes on their strengths. So when Alaskan Yupik high school students were taught geometry using fish racks, so in terms of a practical kind of thing, they did better than when they were taught conventionally, regardless of the form of assessment used. So they learn better when the materials they use fit the skills and knowledge they have. All right, so I'm going to move on. All right, so then let me talk about a different aspect of this. So the question is, can you apply this kind of thinking to the United States? And to the kinds of kids you're used to, you know, like from New York or Ithaca or wherever. So I'm particularly interested in college admissions. My first job uh, out of college was as an admissions officer. So can we apply these ideas to college admissions? So it's possible to assess the US in a way that it inc simultaneously increases prediction and reduces multicultural differences. So now we're applying these ideas to college admissions. So the first project we did was radio. We had roughly 1,000 high school students, seniors and college freshmen from around the nation. Uh, this was when I was at Yale. Uh, it, they ranged greatly in academic skills, uh, geographic area, and then we did a project at Tufts when I was Dean of Arts and Sciences in Tufts uh, with roughly 30,000 high school seniors applying to Tufts University. And this was not just a research project, uh, this was actually doing it. So, when you applied to Tufts, you had the option to do kaleidoscope, which was questions that measured creative, analytical, practical, wisdom-based skills. And then I went to Panorama, and that's still going at Oklahoma State, and we did the same kinds of things. Okay, so we went from the Yale study, which was all over the country, to the Tufts study, which was actually using the stuff for admissions, to Oklahoma State, actually using it for admissions. And then I'll talk about something I've done in so how do you, the analytical stuff, we measure the same way everyone else does. We, you know, we had number series, and we had figure out meanings from words from context. Uh, you know, we had nonverbal analogies, boring stuff. I mean, you know, same thing you'd find on an IQ test or whatever. But then we had some creativity measures. So here you would caption a cartoon. Um, and you know, a more creative response would be tie dyed a list would be caught in the copier. Uh, or another question we used, uh, um, this was on Kaleidoscope, which was a Tufts. Suppose some event in history had come out differently, how would life be different today? So these are just examples. There are lots of questions. Um, my book, College Admissions for the 21st Century, gives many, many different questions we used at Tufts. So this is one of the essays we got. If the Trojans had heeded Laocoon's advice and thrown a diseases would wooden horse into the sea, they would have defeated, defeated the Greeks of Troy. Aeneas would then never have had reason to flee the city, and he would never have ventured to Italy and Rome. Without Rome, neither the Roman Republic nor a Roman Empire would have existed. Concrete, the arch plumbing of the slime would never have been 
invented. <laughs> the modern implications of Rome that Rome existed are indeed drastic. <coughs> Lacking even concrete floors, people would resort to sleeping in the mud, and without plumbing or saunas, they would be perpetually filthy and generally quite chilly. <laughs> France could not have built the base of the Eiffel Tower without arches, so tourists would be unable to purchase many people like the Tower. It's a well but if you look at the actual structure of the writing, it's nothing special. What's special about it is it's very creative. It's novel and compelling. Okay? Here's another essay. <coughs> what if the ratification of the 19th Amendment did not pass and women would ever get the right to vote? What would life for women like me be like in the United States? For one thing, I probably would not be writing this essay. If women were not given the right to vote, I probably would stop going to school after this year, and it would be unlikely that I would receive a college education. Without suffrage, my career options would be limited if a career were a possibility at all. My accepted practices would be limited to staying home and taking care of the family. Rather than being equal, most women would be subservient to men. I might not drive, I might not dress in the way in which I choose to, and I might not be able to vote in the way that I can in the 21st century. In terms of the writing, this essay is as good as or better than the first one. It's very well written. The sentences follow one from the other. It's very coherent, more coherent than the first one. Uh, it's very nicely written, and it's not as creative. So the point, now that's not to downgrade the second essay. Analytically, it's at least as strong as the first essay. Uh, but uh, maybe stronger, the first essay is more creative. So the point is not that one's better. It's that they're good and different. And we've used other tests, design a scientific experiment on a problem of interest to you, use a given set of words in a creative story, write a story based on one of the following titles, The End of FTV, Confessions of a Middle School Bully, The Mysterious Lab. So we used, in Tufts and at Oklahoma State, lots of different essays like these. Uh, we did uh, factor analysis, I, I don't think I know, I don't have the, I didn't bring the numbers, but basically what we found in terms of factors, this is all published, uh, is we got one factor for creative performance, uh, which is good, you know, we want a separate factor for creativity. We got factor three for practical performance, that's good. And the second factor was supposed to be analytical, but it was actually multiple choice. All of the multiple choice tests, regardless of what they were supposed to measure, measured analytical things. <coughs> so the creative ones, the practical ones, the analytical ones, all. So multiple choice tests tend to, to, to load on one factor. And I have the data, but I, I didn't put the numbers in there. So another question is, how do you do in predicting freshman grades, which is what we were funded for by the college board? So if you look at the creative tests, they substantially increased prediction over the SAT. From you know, R squared uh, 0.098 to 186. Uh, and it, so it, if you actually looked at the analytical, it added nothing. And if you looked at the practical, it added. Basically, if you put in analytical, creative, and practical, more than double prediction over the SAT. That's not because the SAT is a bad test. It's that tests like the SAT and ACT do not and are not intended to measure creative and practical skills. So what we're arguing is that these tests tell you something that traditional tests don't tell you. I don't have the full set of numbers here, but again, it's all published and I can send you more. Uh, if you look at racial and ethnic group differences, uh, they were larger for the SAT, the first two red bars, than for our tests, the green and the blue bars. Uh, this is a, an omega squared. If you look at Cone's D, same result. So we increased prediction at the same time we decreased ethnic group differences. This was for rainbow. Uh, on Kaleidoscope and Tufts, we found actually no ethnic group differences. We increased prediction of freshman GPA, holding constant SAT and high school GPA. Uh, there was significant prediction of extracurricular active citizenship and leadership involvement, and we increased applicant satisfaction. So, Tufts is still using Kaleidoscope. Uh, at Oklahoma State, I only stayed three years, so I didn't have formal data, but Oklahoma State, is, I was provost there for three years. Uh, but it, it's been very successful, panorama, and it's still being used. Okay, so when we got to, I came to Cornell, and we were funded to do a test for graduate admissions. 
because all of the work before had been for undergraduate missions. And the question was, I, I, I've always had a queasy feeling about using GREs to predict graduate success since Wendy Williams and I did a study years ago on the predicted validity of the GRE for success in psychology at Yale, and it just didn't do anything beyond predicting first year grades. So uh, my wife Karen and I devised tests, and we sought to design an assessment that could be used for graduate admissions in behavioral brain sciences. And the assessment is three subtests, generating hypotheses, designing experiments, and finding flaws. The newest version, which we're just starting to use, we, we don't know, we haven't even tested the subjects, also has he serving as either a junior reviewer or a junior editor. So you're acting as though you're a reviewer of a scientific article or an editor and commenting on an experiment that is written up. And these are, you know, again, I have some other data, but I just wanted to show you something because these are totally new data. They're a couple weeks old. And what you'll see is we have two factors, and we use letter series, number series, and verbal analogies for academic tests. And we use their generating hypothesis, designing experiments, and finding flaws for our tests of the scientific abilities you need to succeed in a research career. And you'll notice we got two clear factors. The academic measures factored together, and our new measures factored together. Again, suggesting that whatever, and we also had SAT scores, which in another factor analysis uh, load on the academic intelligence measure. The point being that whatever it is you need to succeed in graduate school, it's different from what the GREs measure, and it goes beyond. I'm not saying the GREs are bad, it's just that the kinds of skills involved in scientific reasoning are different, and what we're trying to do is devise uh, assessments that measure those. And so these, these experiments are ongoing, and these are literally our first data. I've only been at Cornell a little over a year, but we think the data are very promising. Uh, then we did a project at the University of Michigan Business School. We sought to design a test for business school admissions to supplement the GMAC. Uh, this is, had scenarios that would <coughs> require business decisions in various areas, such as managing, marketing, and sales. We had long and short forms. And we found that the test <coughs> improved prediction of academic performance. It reduced ethnic differences. Uh, and the assessment predicted performance on an independent project, which the GMAT didn't do. So, so the point I've been trying to make throughout, whether I'm talking about admissions or testing in Kenya or wherever it is, is that if you want to talk about what it means to be smart, Talking just about conventional test scores tells you something, but it doesn't tell you a lot. Then you have to think about what does it mean to be smart in a given context, and that may be very different from what it is that's measured on an IQ test or an ACT or a GMAT or an LSAT or whatever. How have we gotten to where we are today? Uh, we sort of have this entrenched system. It's been around for a long time. A lot of people profit from it. And what ends up happening is we have closed systems. In other words, what does it take to succeed? Well, I know because I mentioned I did poorly on my key test when I was a kid. My teachers thought I was stupid. I thought I was stupid. I did stupid work. My teachers were happy. I did stupid work. I was happy. They were happy. They were almost kind of happy. And that's the way schooling works today. Kids are identified through, you know, whether it's no child left behind or some other system, SATs is kind of losers. Teachers don't expect much of them. They're treated as losers. They act as losers. And the system is closed. And you know, it's true that standardized tests correlate with all kinds of things, but in a large part, we create the correlation. How do we create the correlation? You know, tests like the ACT or GMA, they have to correlate with later success because they're used as a funnel to get you into the prestigious colleges or graduate schools or business schools or law schools or medical schools that will enable you to succeed in the career later on. So we create the correlation by using these tests. I'm not saying it's totally created, but you know, it, it, it would be the same with, you know, if we used hype, you know, let's, let's say we get into Harvard, you needed to be 
6.5. And to get into L6.1, to get into Cornell 6.3, you know, to get into Podunk, you only have to do 3.1. Uh, if you look at the leaders in society 20 years later, the real leaders are going to be tall. And you find, you know, your Hernstein and Murray or whoever it is, you do a correlation, you find the correlation between success and height is very high, and you have now proved that height causes later success. I mean, that's essentially what we did, experience on performance analysis. So, in conclusion, individuals are better recognized for and are better able to develop and make use of their talents to get smart. Schools teach and assess students better when they recognize that intelligence is not just a measure on some standardized test. And society can better utilize that in the ways of talents of its members. Thank you very much and I'd like to questions. For example, I call them meta components. Everywhere you live, you have to recognize when you have a problem. You know, like your marriage is going bad, your finances are going bad, uh, your kids are going bad, you're going bad, whatever it is. You have to recognize that there's a problem. You have to define what it is. You know, I'm spending too much on my credit cards, or uh, I'm never at home, I'm always giving talks instead of being with my wife and kids and they're getting pissed, or whatever it is. You have to define what the problem is. You have to represent the problem in your head. You know, like, what am I doing wrong? What are other people doing wrong? Uh, then you have to decide how, much, how many resources you can allocate to solving the problem, how much money, how much time, how much energy. Then you have to figure out a strategy, and then you have to implement the strategy, and you have to monitor it, and you have to evaluate it. Those things are the same. What differs is the content. So what I would argue is that the processes, the meta components I just described, are the same everywhere. But the problem is that when you test, you have to instantiate them in some way. And what Binet did that I think really made sense is he instantiated them in the context that he was asked to instantiate them. Kids going to school, that's what he was asked to do. In a way then, that, I think that was better than what Wexler did because Wexler kind of just went off on his own and used testing didn't really have a lot of, them, especially the performance section, clear instantiation. So that's what Binet did. But it was Western school. And so the processes the Eskimo kids use, or the Kenyan kids use, the Tanzanian kids use, they're the same, but the content instantiations are so wildly different that if we test in our own content world, it doesn't make sense. We can translate, but it's still Contexts that are familiar to us that make sense for us, not necessarily contexts that make sense for processes that are the same. Are there other questions? Yes. In your study in the Vancouver Journal, you talk about the role of the Vancouver Journal in teaching the history of the Vancouver Journal. Yeah. And you say that the culture of the teacher makes a difference at all with respect to their flexibility and how they view their students' intelligence and how they define. Well, the, the culture of a teacher makes a huge difference, of course, because we're brought up to value different things. That's, remember those implicit theories? The implicit theories are different in different cultures. They're different in different subcultures. But what's more important than the culture is the teacher's willingness to be flexible and to recognize what I said at the beginning in the theory of successful intelligence, that successfully intelligent people figure out what they're good on and capitalize on it, and figure out what they're not good at, and compensate or correct their weaknesses. And so the teacher can be from any culture and recognize that kids can have different kinds of strengths and develop those kinds of strengths. Or the teacher can sort of look for a cookie, cookie cutter. I want you to be smart the way I am. And that could be the same in any culture, too. You know what I mean? So if you look at graduate professors that I have known, 
Some of them, smart means you do the kind of work I do in my lab, and you 